Hey there, I'm Dr. Ruth Roberts, your pet's ally. I hope that you are having a fantastic day and life is good and everybody's happy. Hio is uh, barking about, I don't know quite what, but that's okay um, because she's entitled to. She's uh, She can't quite see as well as she might like to and uh, so she barks at really strange stuff. But that's not why you are here today. Um, what I will talk with you about is um, what is omega-3 fatty acids. And I apologize. I'm trying to set up the slides while I'm talking to you. Good to see you, Jamie. I hope Willie's doing well today. Um, window. Sorry, I thought I had this set up, and I did not, sadly. So let's try play that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll just have to kind of roll with it. So let me hit that. And who poop. <laughs> Yay! Hopefully it was good poop, because <laughs> it's not fun when it's not. Um, let's see if I can pop over here. Yep. All right, cool. Let me get this going. Excitement. So what I wanted to talk with you about today is omega-3 fatty acids and how we can use that to use them to support pet health. Um, and this is really an interesting topic that's evolved over the years. So 10 years ago, I had an oncologist ask me what dose of, of omega-3 fatty acids I was using for pets, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So we've gone from that um, thing of veterinarians being interested in them, in omega-3s, but not knowing quite what um, what to do with them. So what I'm going to attempt to do for you today is break down how they work, what they are, what conditions are supported with omega-3 fatty acids, how much is needed to uh, treat those specific conditions, and then how do you know your pet actually has enough on board? So here we go. Um, so omega-6 and 3 fatty acids are essential fatty acids, and they must be consumed. So uh, the, the ones that we think of as being the main omegas are the linoleic acid and alpha linoleic acid. They are considered to be essential, meaning you and your dog and your cat have to eat them, but they can be converted into the other omega-3, uh, other omega fatty acids. So in this really busy chart, um, we've got kind of a breakdown between omega-6 and omega-3. So as I said, the um, a linoleic acid, uh, you know, is one of the omega-6s that can come, linoleic itself comes from vegetable oil, safflower oil, and then its breakdown products um, as it goes through this process of being converted into arachidonic acid, which is kind of the, interestingly enough, the top part of the inflammatory uh, chain of events, so to speak. This comes from meat, poultry, eggs, and, and uh, animal fats. Now, omega-3 fatty acids, um, alpha-linoleic alpha acid comes from uh, green leafy vegetables, chia, flaxseed, canola, walnut. And for this reason, you will see um, omega-3 fatty acids being really high in products that have um, flaxseed, but in truth, animals and people really don't digest this very well, so it is not a great source. So it's estimated that humans can absorb about 10% of the omega-3 fatty acids available in flax, dogs and cats even less. So we kind of go down this chain of omega-3 fatty acids, and then we see uh, eicosapentoic acid, or EPAs, um, and the abbreviation is, is uh, understandable at this point. Um, and then DHA, or docosahexaenoic acid. Um, these two are the main um, 
the main omega-3 fatty acids that we talk about on a regular basis. And we'll kind of get to that in a moment. Um, so again, you know, they're the most commonly discussed supplements. And omega-6 and 3 fatty acids are important structural components of cell membranes. So we're hearing a lot about omega-6s aren't really needed and they're creating all the problems, and they are to some degree. But uh, what's important to know is that they are an important form of all of the cell membranes. They help form signaling molecules and uh, receptor, and they participate in creating receptors that receive the signals. So in short, they help the body to communicate. And if we break that down a little bit further, we're going to see that there are membrane components um, that help derive from omega-3s, omega uh, in particular that improve membrane fluidity or the ability to kind of adjust with the way things go. Um, protein localization, ion channel function, and again, these are signaling and communication methods. And then the other thing is that omega-3s become substrates for the signaling molecules. So the eicosanoids, which are omega-3s, prostaglandins, which are molecules that can create inflammation, leukotrienes, which can either create more inflammation or downregulate it, and endocannabinoids, which we, you know, we think of the, we think of um, CBD and things of that, that nature when we talk about endocannabinoids, but it turns out that, yes, there is an endogenous um, version of this within the body. And so things like uh, opioids that the body produces, endorphins, things of that nature also can, um, can be really important too. So let me pop this back up. Sorry, this, uh, the technology is kicking me in the butt a little bit today. So the other thing that it does is it helps with receptor-mediated signaling. So both the extracellular and intracellular receptors. And these are going to be in various organ systems throughout the body. So long-chain omega-3 fatty acids, you may also hear these called PUFAs, or polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, so let's see. Hang on a second here. Let me see if I can. Thanks, Shani, for pointing this out. Let me see if I can get some help with that. Okay, cool. Hopefully this is better now. Is that working? The audio is a little bit better for you, Shani? Um, hopefully so. So let me pop this back up here. So again, the other thing you may hear uh, omega-3 fatty acids called are PUFAs, or polyunsaturated fatty acids. And uh, they help the body to resolve inflammation. So one of the things I mentioned earlier is that omega-6 fatty acids are found in many foods. But because of the way that our food animals are produced on super highly processed grain diets, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 gets skewed. And so the omega-6 fatty acids end up predominating. So there's some uh, help with this in terms of feeding grass-fed or pasture-raised animals because then the uh, omega-3 fatty acids ratio drops back down into more of a normal range. And we'll talk a little bit more about ratio in a little bit too. Uh, so where do these things come from? The omega-6 fatty acids come from plant oils, nuts, seed, and animal fats. Um, and omega-3 fatty acids come from fish, phytoplankton, algae, some seed oils, and, and some nuts as well. But out of all of those sources, the, the things that can provide the most sort of high dosing is going to be fish and then algae. And there's some, um, there's some work being done with phytoplankton, but uh, you know, krill oil, salmon oil, 
and then the more res, um, sort of re, renewable resources, which would be things like um, our, our anchovies and sardines, and then algae would be the better options. When omega-6 fatty acids predominate, and, and really this is when either we're not eating enough omega-3s or uh, we're eating way too much omega-6s, inflammation increases in the body. And it may not be that we and our pets are eating too much omega-6, although that's super easy to do, but it may be that the consumption of omega-3 fatty acids are just too low. So that's a really important concept to, to kind of get. We, you know, we want, we've been sort of vilifying everything as far as, you know, these highly processed diets, creating inflammation and things of that nature. That is true, but it may simply be that we're not able to eat enough omega-3s to kind of offset things. So bear that in mind too. Now, this super, um, complicated looking chart, this kind of looks at the current breakdown or ratio of common pet foods. So we're having a ratio of 20 parts of omega-6s to one part of omega-3. So again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, linoleic acid turns into, ah, okay, now it's worse. Okay, sorry, Shandy, it may be my internet is tired for the day. So hopefully things will uh, will improve. If it doesn't, we will upload a recorded version of this um, of this video for you. So just kind of hopefully this will things will smooth out a wee bit. If it doesn't, uh, we'll punt. Um, so at any rate, we're getting 20 parts in in many cases of omega sixes to omega-3 fatty acids. And as I mentioned earlier, linoleic acid gets converted into arachidonic acid, which is the top of the inflammatory uh, cascade. And so then we end up with all these inflammatory molecules, the eicosanoids, the pl prostaglandins, things of this nature. And then if we come over onto the omega-3 side, um, we end up having alpha linoleic acid. <laughs> yeah, Facebook freezing up. I think this is why I quit doing a lot of broadcasts on Facebook because it would just kill me. Um, so we'll try we'll try this and see what happens if it continues to be a problem. I, I may punt back to YouTube. But at any rate, so omega-3s, we're taking that alpha linoleic acid and to some degree converting it into EPA and DHA, uh, but really more often we have to flat eat those things. And what happens is we get these uh, substances that are minimally inflammatory as far as the eicosanoid goes. And the other really major thing, big thing, is that omega-3 fatty acids actually help to resolve inflammation and they create uh, substances called resolvents, interestingly enough, and protectants. The thing that's really interesting about resolvents, this is supposed, this is becoming a huge area of research because there are in people many chronic diseases that are chronic because the body doesn't make enough resolvents. So this is going to, this is going to be a new field that's coming out. Somebody's actually developed a, a supplement that consists of resolvents themselves. So that's neat stuff coming up. So how do these guys actually work? How do omega-3 fatty acids help? Again, by directly reducing inflammation. Uh, so literally it extinguishes the fire, so to speak. And again, by re inducing the resolvent production. So again, humans, we can convert some fatty acids to omega-3s, but cats really poorly convert and dogs minimally per convert. So really both dogs and cats and frankly humans need to eat arachidonic acid, especially cats, as well as EPA and DHA. And what I want to step back and kind of point out is that arachidonic acid 
does start the inflammatory cascade, but it is also critical for um, cellular health as well. So for instance, corticosteroids work by inhibiting arachidonic acid production or actually pro or being converted into other substances, which is great. That helps the inflammation. But then after a while, you start to notice things like muscle breakdown, bone loss, things of that nature. So it, omega-6s are not something we shouldn't eat, but we just need to either A, keep them balanced with omega-3s, or choose to eat uh, foods that have a better ratio between 6 and 3. So what conditions can omega-3 fatty acids help? So I think any type of inflammatory condition that you can think of, and if we go back to the concepts in functional medicine where instead of looking at organ disease we look at systems of function. So if the organ uh, is inflamed then that creates a health problem. So what kind of organs can we see get inflamed? Well first of all the immune system. So with immune disease we'll see omega-3 fatty acids reduce systemic inflammation and there's a lot of people that talk about your uh, inflammation load through the system as far as creating potential effects for other health issues in the future. It helps to reduce tissue damage and also it helps to alter types of immune mediators so that we are not um, creating more and more and more inflammation and especially inappropriate inflammation where the immune system is ta attacking self. And then again, enhance resolve and production. So start making more of these mediators that can actually help solve the immune issue. In joint disease, in veterinary medicine, uh, and as so all of these conditions I'm talking about, there are papers that where people have looked at how do omega-3 fatty acids help or don't help pets. So in joint disease, again, we see reducing inflammation within the joint. Um, so for the pets that are arthritic, there is a component of inflammation within the joint itself and physically improving weight bearing. So they've used force plate analysis, meaning they get a dog to stand on a plate and see if the weight distribution is even on all four feet or not. And so what they're seeing with omega-3 fatty acids is that uh, at appropriate doses, the weight balance around all four feet starts to improve. In skin conditions, we can actually see reduced itchiness uh, and then with that, less self-trauma from scratching and itching and then also pretty improved quote, uh, coat quality and health. So for skin disease, I think this is one of the first places where uh, veterinary supplement companies started producing omega-3 fatty acids and they were all targeted towards pets with skin issues. In heart disease this is really quite interesting. So cardiac cachexia is something that happens in pets with late stage um, heart disease where they're starting to lose weight because the, the heart simply can't keep up with the demands of the body. The other thing that's been seen is reduced arrhythmias. So again, for pets that have uh, specific types of heart disease, they can end up having abnormal rhythms. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about humans, but it's interesting in people with what are considered to be adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids, they have a 90% reduced risk of having a heart attack. And that's pretty astonishing. So clearly there is more protection that occurs to the heart uh, than, we're, than what's been looked at in veterinary medicine. That happens way before the pet gets sick. So we don't have science there, but again, you know, for Sadly, in veterinary medicine, uh, unless there's some money to be made on a study, so a drug, a supplement, something of that nature, the basic science just doesn't get done. GI disease, we see it, omega-3 fatty acids help to control inflammatory bowel disease. Now, 
um, what's beginning to happen is that everybody uses omega-3 fatty acids for everything. And so we start to see some sensitivities to specific uh, species. So things, <laughs> thanks Shani. So things that, um, things that, you know, salmon, we think of that as pretty innocuous. Well, we're starting to see dogs and cats with salmon sensitivities. Um, I had a client that had been using an omega-3 fatty acid supplement that I recommended made from anchovies and sardines. And after some years, we saw that turn into a problem. So if you start, if you have a pet with, omega, with uh, inflammatory bowel disease and you start throwing omega-3 fatty acids at it, just be mindful. If you see things get worse, you may need a different form. And that's where you could look at something like calamari oil or algae oil because that's, um, you know, basically there's, there's no history of sensitivity that I, that I am aware of to algae oil. But unfortunately, it is dreadfully expensive to manufacture right now. Um, and so we're, you know, hopefully that's going to change because we are overfishing. And this is one of the downsides. That's why I think it's so important to use more sustainable products like calamari, anchovy, or sardines. Uh, fluted or flu feline lower urinary tract disease. This is such a bizarre disease. and. In women, there is something called uh, interstitial cystitis. And so many veterinarians have started kind of looking at fluted as interstitial cystitis. And indeed, it is completely uh, an inflammatory disease. So large doses of omega-3 fatty acids and other, other things that will help reduce inflammation um, helps cats with fluted powerfully. And, and thankfully, uh, most fish-based oils, cats are willing to eat. Uh, so that helps us out tremendously as well. Now, the other thing, and cats don't really get dry eye, um, but uh, conjunctivitis sica, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's considered to be an autoimmune disease in dogs. And in humans, probably... Uh, 15 years ago, I got diagnosed with KCS, and that was one of the first things that my ophthalmologist said was take, take a ton of omega-3 fatty acids. And to his credit, um, the disease, I have irritation, but it's never progressed to the point where I needed medication. So finally, veterinarians are starting, you know, on, in mainstream at that is, are trying uh, omega-3 fatty acids for dogs with KCS, and they're seeing improvements. So it's like everything, you know, if your dog has the beginning symptoms of KCS, high doses of omega-3 fatty acids are going to be, have much more of an impact than if your dog has already been on um, cyclosporine or um, any of the other medications for years and has the really gross eyes. So, and I just realized I did not put the slides back on for you guys. So let me pop that back up. Um, so you can take a look at them. So, so, because I love this picture of the cat kind of peeking out. So again, KCS, definitely a good place to start. And then sort of a loose um, accumulation of stuff under neurology. We know in people, <coughs> excuse me, and, and in dogs that we've seen omega-3 fatty acids improve cognitive function. So again, in humans, um, Alzheimer's disease is considered to be type three diabetes. And this chronic inflammation of, you know, in, inability to use sugar properly, to things of that nature, creates chronic inflammation, creates deposition of amyloid, which is a, Kind of a weird protein substance that really balls things up. So it does, again, omega-3 fatty acids do seem to help improve cognitive function. Um, in dogs, they've seen that it reduces aggressive behavior um, and it may reduce the severity of epilepsy. Now, having said this, on the human side again, uh, we've seen that it helps to relieve anxiety. Um, they can also help to reduce depression. And 
while we talk about anxiety frequently for pets, we don't really talk about depression because I don't know, I guess we don't have a good way to define it. And I think pet owners will say this uh, from some time to time and, and I think they're right because they're observing changes in their pets' behaviors. And then kind of the big daddy, um, cancer. It does improve outcomes alongside the um, alongside either conventional chemotherapeutics or uh, alternative supplements. Now, for years, I have said that um, if your pet is receiving chemotherapy, you should have them off of omega-3 fatty acids the day before and for three days afterwards. But there's some literature coming out on the human side that's saying that this probably is not necessary because the, uh, the chemotherapeutics are becoming more and more targeted. And even with the older drugs, they're going to affect the faster growing cells, which are the cancer cells. And then in this paper, there was a significant increase in survival time for stage three lymphoma, which is pretty remarkable. So that leads us back to another question. So how much do we need to give these guys to help with these specific conditions? So I mentioned all of those things I just talked about were based on research. And so here we're looking at doses that were used in, um, in these papers to study how, how can we get things kind of uh, improved. And so for frame of reference, so the appro approximate EPA and DHA dosing in milligrams for a 20 kilogram dog, that's about a 44 pound dog. Um, one other thing I want to mention too is that when you look at omega-3 fatty acid supplements or fish oil, you're going to see several things on the label. One is how many milligrams of fish oil. Don't stop there. Go down to the EPA and DHA content to get the actual milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids per supplement, capsule or pill or whatever it is. So. Idiopathic hyperlipidemia, for those of you that have had schnauzers, you know what this is. Um, they, for whatever reason, this breed has problems dealing with fats appropriately. And it can really become a serious health problem because the fat sort of takes up too much space in, in blood and prevents really important things from going on like um, transference of nutrients, adequate oxygenation, and it can increased clotting and things of that nature. So kidney disease is another one where we know that this provides a tremendous benefit. Um, cardiovascular disease, as I mentioned, and then osteoarthritis, um, and then inflammatory bowel disease. And then the two things on the bottom, the NRC, the National Research Council, thinks that uh, 14 milligrams per kilogram per day of omega-3 fatty acids is adequate. And the safe upper limit is somewhere around 175 milligrams per kilograms per day. So again, for this 44 pound dog, we're seeing the dosage, dosages of omega-3s range from just over 1,000 milligrams per day to almost 3,000 in the case of osteoarthritis. And so that's a huge, huge um, shift in, in values. So kind of think about that as we go a little further. Uh, in, you know, in that dosing range, again, we're looking at a starting dose of somewhere around 50 milligrams per kilogram per day to keep your pet healthy. And then if there is more of an inflammatory issue going on, using the higher limits, that 100 mg per kg per day or even higher. So again, you know, there's some out, outlines of what's probably safe. Um, and so, you know, 200 mg per kg per day is starting to be used commonly in cancer. Um, and that seems to be fine. Now, in cats, they're always a little different, but we're, we're still going with, um, you know, somewhere around uh, that 50 mg per kg per day starting dose. 
And obviously because cats are smaller, we don't need as much. Um, so, you know, a seven pound cat, um, the is gonna be somewhere around 350 milligrams. And then in an arthritis study, they used 106 milligrams per kilogram. We don't really know what the upper limits of safety is for cats, but usually um, that 175 mg per kg per day seems to be safe, although other, other researchers have used um, that cancer dose of 200 mg per kg per day. And some of the um, prescription diets will actually exceed this amount. So <clears throat> that brings us to kind of another issue. What about commercial pet food content? Pardon me. Well, all of them are formulated to meet the minimal, minimal requirement uh, as per AFCO or the American Association of Feed Control Officials. Um, so, you know, so that's kind of what these numbers are about, the ALA minimum requirement for puppies, EPA and DHA, and then adults, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is, is that what the omega-3 and 6 levels started out in as uh, when that food was manufactured probably changes dramatically uh, by the time it gets to your pet because of improper storage and lack of antioxidant content. So often they'll put vitamin E or rosemary oil or something like that, but it's an, at a number that is insufficient to really preserve the omega-3 fatty acids or the polyunsaturated fatty acids. So if you're relying on your uh, a commercial food to provide the omega-3 fatty acids, probably your pet is going to be well underdosed. Now, the other question is side effects. Uh, so for instance, when probably, oh, 20 years ago, my mother started taking omega-3 fatty acids because, um, because it helped some very mild arthritis she had. It helped a couple of other conditions as far as GI problems. And her doctor told her, told her to stop. And the reason is that uh, it could increase bleeding because she was taking baby aspirin. And so she told me this and I said, well, what's, what's providing you more, um, more relief, the baby aspirin or the fish oil? And she said the, the fish oil. So, yeah. Um, so this is, this is a big problem. There is, and Jamie, I'll, I'm going to come back to your question about, about uh, Willie, too. Um, so there are potential adverse effects or side effects with omega-3 fatty acids. And this paper went through all the things that people could think about that would, would scare them. So the main ones are going to be altered platelet function, GI adverse effects um, because of the high fat, detrimental effects on wound healing, lipid peroxidation, meaning they change um, fats from sort of innocuous into things that create, that are um, free radicals, and uh, the potential for gaining weight because they're eating fat and toxin exposure, which is, which is a real concern. Um, and then altered immune function, all this other good stuff. Now, the vast majority of these, um, they went through and looked at studies. And with the altered platelet function, and this is kind of the most serious one, uh, they, you know, they really couldn't find that this was a big problem. Uh, and st studies that they looked at kind of varied as far as, did, was there a problem, was there not a problem? Um, and so the, the, really the jury couldn't, couldn't hang omega-3 fatty acids on altered platelet function. Uh, as far as GI adverse effect, um, there were effects as far as loose stool and things of that nature at super high doses, although many of, the, many of these issues were looked at in terms of a food that contained omega-3 fatty acids, and so they couldn't decide if it was omega-3s or, uh, or they actually it was just the food being different. Um, and then altered wound healing, um, 
really the, some studies said yes, it slowed down wound healing, and some studies said no. Uh, and this could make some really big uh, changes because we rely on inflammation as the first in the first two weeks of wound healing. So if we're delaying inflammation, this is going to slow down the, the ability of the wound to heal. So again, mixed bag of results, um, and, and there was not enough there to make me be concerned about it. And then again, liquid uh, peroxidation. Notice the doses here. They're giving one, a little over a gram per kilogram. So again, a gram is uh, 100 milligrams um, uh, and almost a gram of DHA. And at that um, level, they did start to see some changes. But that's like an enormous dose, at least a five-fold over any of the current uh, any of the current dosing that's recommended. Um, and so again, in all of these other studies, it was a mixed bag of results. Um, one of the other concerns was toxin exposure because fish uh, do they do con or concentrate heavy metals and other chemicals like PCBs and things of that nature and hypervitaminosis A and D. And really, they could not find this as a problem in any, any of the pets that were out there. There were no clinical reports of it. But it is very important to make sure that the product that you are using does have a great and clean manufacturing process to help remove all of these things. And then lastly, um, they were, you know, again concerned about pancreatitis, but there was no evidence of omega-3 fatty acids causing or inducing pancreatitis. So one of the other things I'm going to put out to you is that there is a reason to test for omega-3 levels in pets. And this, t there is a company called Omega Quant, and they started out on the human side. So um, something like 17 years ago, uh, the gentleman that formed uh, Omega Quant, he and another researcher read that the statistic I told you earlier, that humans that had adequate levels of omega-3 had a 90% reduced risk of heart, having a heart attack. And at that point, heart attack was the number one killer of people. So they developed you know, the, the idea about this test. And so about 17 years later, cardiologists are just sort of catching on to this and that they may um, they may be able to use this in some way or another. So the why is because we can use this, this test to help us make sure that we're really getting to adequate levels uh, in, in the pet's body. The test measures the amount of the omega-3 in the red blood cell, which is considered to be a much more stable measure than the plasma, because that's going to vary on diet and things of that nature and the time after um, the um, supplement's been eaten. And we can also see that supplementation increases omega-3 fatty acids in the red blood cells. So. That's really important because, again, at the beginning of the talk, if you'll remember, I told you that omega-3s and omega-6s are components of cell membranes. And the cells look sort of like this, where the lipids are lined up to produce, um, to, to produce this membrane that holds the insides of the cell in the cell and the outsides in the plasma serum, things of that nature, outside. Uh, and then there are pumps and things of that nature which help to get nutrients across. So what we're able to do is measure 24 fatty acids from, that, from a dried blood spot um, by gas chr chromatography. So that's pretty slick. The other thing, the other reasons this is important is that we've been using EPA and DHE DHA for years to support conditions affecting joint, coat, skin, oral cavity, et cetera, et cetera. 
And again, pet foods can advertise that they have omega-3 and 6 fatty acids, um, but again, often they misrepresent what they are. Often they're alpha-linoleic or linoleic acids and not preformed EPA and DHA. And dogs and cats have an even more limited ability to make EPA and DHA than humans. So measuring blood levels of omega-3s can ensure that we're actually getting the appropriate dose into the pet, into their tissues where it, where it needs to be to do the work. And so, you know, if you do a test, this is, you'll get this report back um, that shows that your pet is just barely in the reference range, but hopefully it's more up towards that seven or eight percent. Now, if it comes back with 10%, is that bad? Probably not. Um, they're really, you know, when they started looking at omega-3 fatty acids, they were giving people doses of something like 25 grams. So 2,500, um, excuse me, 25,000 milligrams per day. And that's just an astronomical dose. Um, but they didn't see any side effects other than uh, the occasional GI issue because of the volume of the oil. Uh, so what these tests will allow us to do is to tailor the omega-3 dose to a specific patient so it is optimal, especially for that disease and then we can make sure that that pet's level is getting where it's supposed to go and then you know based on how well your pet is metabolizing omega-3 fatty acids and and utilizing them the suggested doses may actually be too high or too low for your pet but the overall goal is to make sure that they're feeling better in the process so Jamie back to your question um, you know Willie's getting let's see, 1,472 milligrams of EPA and 1,000 milligrams, you're welcome, Janet, of DHA, so a total of 33,000 uh, mil milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids per day. So Willie is, uh, for those of you that don't know Jamie and Willie, Willie is a tough, tough guy who's been battling an extremely ugly form of cancer successfully for, for many more months than anybody expected. But, um, you know, what you would do is take your pet's weight. Um, so let me pop out of here for a second. Um, pop that calendar up and calculator. Cool, eight months. I know he is a tough son of a buck. So if we... You know, let's say, I think Willie is somewhere around 65 pounds, let's say. So what you would do is plug 65 into your calculator, divide that by 2.2, and that's going to give you his weight in kilograms. So that's 29.54. So if we use that cancer dose of 2... Two hundred, then that's going to give us almost six thousand milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids per day, and that's an astronomically high dose. Um, and Nordic Naturals is a good brand of um, of omega-3 fatty acids, and I think that they have been really, really have been champions in as far as getting good quality uh, products produced. So it is a much higher dose than, than most folks have looked at before. So at this point, you know, if Willie does not have any problems, and again, Willie's got some tummy issues, so if, if he does not have any issues with omega-3 fatty acids, that'd be one of the first things I'd add back in and see if you can titrate the dose up to that almost... Um, almost 6,000 milligrams per day. And Shani, I will do my best to summarize. Um, but here's, here's the, <laughs> so let me get, get a little bit further down. And then if you guys have questions, pop them up in the comments. I am happy to answer them. So we've got a couple of great things coming on here. Um, 
One is standard process has produced an extremely high quality VF omega-3 fatty acid supplement. We're at about 450 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids per capsule. Now, this is great for most average pets and for, um, for well pets, but for a dog like Willie, we may need to look for some other, uh, other options. And I'll, I'm gonna show you in a minute how you can, um, how you can enter to win. Uh, but back to your question, Shani, um, more and more research is coming out that's showing that without omega-3 fatty acids, a lot of inflammatory conditions just go unregulated. Um, there is more research on the human side looking at how omega-3 fatty acids help prevent disease. And in fact, they may be linked to slowing down epigenetic aging, meaning that the things that can really screw up our DNA are pushed backwards and the telomeres are lengthened, um, you know, so that the DNA continues to work more normally for longer. So if I, if I could say anything at all, uh, I think that this is a core supplement for every pet and for every person. The problem is, is that um, it, it is something that is taxing on our environment. So there's some options coming out. Use sustainable stuff, use an anchovy or sardine and or sardine-based omega-3, use a calamari oil, and use a high-quality manufacturer. And 50 milligrams per day um, is probably a reasonable dose based on all the crap that we have created in the environment that's creating the diseases we see today, the cancer that we're seeing at five, six, seven, eight years of age, the kidney failure, the GI disease, the autoimmune disease. This is one supplement that has the potential to really make a huge difference in making pets feel better, but also more importantly, preventing them from having problems. So that's the deal. <laughs> that's the deal right there. So like I said, we do have a giveaway we're going to start working on. I will drop this link in the comments for you. Head over here, sign up. Um, we're going to run this through October uh, fifth, when we'll draw some names. When you sign up, we'll be sending you some additional information about omega-3 fatty acids. And um, also when the uh, omega-3 index test becomes available, we'll be offering some discounts on that. Now, the thing that's really cool about this test is that it is um, a small card that you put a drop of blood on. And so this has something that you could do at home. There are tons of videos out there about pet parents that give, um, that take their pet's blood for, um, for, for blood sugar every day. And so this is something you can do at home. So check that out. And Janet is asking, is mackerel okay? And it is indeed a fantastic source of omega-3 fatty acids. So I, you know, I jumped into supplements, but obviously if you are uh, feeding salmon or mackerel, and Hyo needs to come back up, she says, um, that is a fantastic source of omega-3 fatty acids. The other fantastic source is sardines. Um, so a tin of sardines is equivalent to about 1,700 some odd milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids, and some of them are, are even higher. So again, you know, if you know, make sure it's it's caught cleanly. Um, the upside of the omega-3 is that it is low. Of the supplement version of it is that it has been cleaned of PCBs, plastics mercury, other heavy metals, things of that nature. But eating some salmon, eating some mackerel, eating some sardines is a great way to, uh, to get more omega-3 fatty acids in your diet. What other questions do you all have? Any, anything else you can think of? Um, I just, 
I, I feel very passionately about omega-3s because they have made such a big difference for, for so many of my patients. So, you know, if you haven't yet, hit the link, go sign up. Um, we'll get you entered to win one of the three free bottles that Standard Process has shared with us. And uh, then we'll announce the winners on October 5th. So that's what I've got for you today. Um, really appreciate you all spending time with me. And uh, if, we've, if we find the video is too glitchy, we will upload a clean copy of it. So take good care of yourselves. And remember, for those of you that aren't familiar with the crock pet diet, check it out because your pet's best health truly does start in the bowl. I'm Dr. Ruth Roberts, your pet's ally. Thanks so much for joining. Thank <laughs> you.